Hi everybody and welcome back to Pagan's Reading Nook. My name is Pagan and today I'm joined by a very awesome and very special guest and that is Melinda Taub and I hope I pronounced your last name correctly. Um, you nailed it. <laughs> perfect. Uh, Melinda is the author of the latest book which is The Scandalous Confessions of Lydia Bennett Witch which was amazing and we're going to talk all about that but it was such a great book. But Melinda, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. So first things first, I love Pride and Prejudice. Absolutely huge fan, massive love of it forever. And reading your book was just giving me all the great feels of that book, but it with like almost a modern twist to it, which was so awesome. Oh, that's great. That's, you know, I was really hoping that it would sort of feel like almost like a piece of Pride and Prejudice that you hadn't seen before but you know obviously I also live in 2023 so from a modern perspective (laughs) it um, was so great so so great oh thank you so what kind of made you decide to do almost like a rewrite of Pride and Prejudice um I also really love Pride and Prejudice if you could probably tell from reading the book it's definitely a book written by someone who has read Pride and Prejudice many many times um and some of my many rereadings, I'd say, you know, maybe like rereadings 31 through 38, were um, a few years ago, I was working as a writer for um, a late night comedy political show, uh, Full Frontal with Samantha B, which for me was great. <laughs> um, it was, you know, I loved working there, loved working for Sam. It was a dream. It was really like, I feel like that was one of my like lifetime dreams before the show even existed at all Mm -hmm. so I I used to watch the daily show and I'd think oh this is so funny and she's so funny and like I wish there was more of her I wish she had her own show and I wish I could write for it and then all of that came true (laughs) which was amazing Mm -hmm. thing um but also as you could probably imagine like writing a political show a political feminist show during um you know the, the years of 2016 and yeah, the following years. Th- those were some years. And trust me, I, I loved the fact that Samantha B was like the prime voice of mm-hmm. like feminism during that time period, which I was like, yes, I love her so much. Um, I watched the show thank religiously. You. So, <laughs> oh, great. Yeah. Um, thank you. And, you know, it was wonderful to be able to sort of like have that catharsis as a writer for me to be able to like, when I saw something that like really scared me or infuriated me, I could take it to the show and write about it and write a bunch of dumb jokes about it. And, um, and then, you know, a pretty Canadian lady would scream it into your television. And that was, <laughs> for me, that was the perfect way to get through those years, but it was also really stressful. Um, it really like when you're, when you're writing about current events that way, you're really living in a world of like fear and anger and sadness all the time. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, Cause you're very rarely writing about good things. Um, and, you know, it's fun to make jokes, but first you have to absorb the terrible things. Yep. Um, so I would, especially once I became head writer, I found that I had a lot of trouble sort of like powering down at night. Mm-hmm. Um, and one of the ways that I would sort of like calm down enough to sleep is I would read a chapter of Pride and Prejudice before bed. Um, and I think, I mean, one of the great things about Pride and Prejudice is that, and all Jane Austen's works is you could kind of like, they'll meet you where you need them to be that day. Right. Like if yeah. you if you want a soothing romance novel that'll help you drift off to sleep, they are that and they have happy endings. Um, but they are also sort of, you know, they have some pretty scathing things to say about class and the role of women <laughs> in society as well, yes. if you're in the mood for that. <laughs> um, and so when I was rereading it, I think I was sort of like, I came to it for the sort of joy and comfort a lot of the time, but I couldn't stop thinking about um, the other things that I was writing about during the day. Mm-hmm. And in particular, I got sort of stuck on the character of Lydia, um, who, if you, if you don't know Pride and Prejudice, uh, she is the youngest sister. She drives a lot of the plot um, because she's kind of a mess. Um, yeah. She breaks rules <laughs> that women are not supposed to break and not in like a cool badass way, in a like kind of, flaky way um flaky and you know a little bit selfish is how she comes across um and but she is also 16 years old and the sort of denouement of her uh of her misbehavior is that at 16 spoilers for Pride and Prejudice 
Uh, she gets married to a guy who's about 28 years old, who everyone agrees is a terrible guy and isn't going to be able to take care of her. And that's just, but everyone agrees that's just what she has to do. And her father basically announces he's never going to see her again because of what she did, uh, even though it's kind of his fault for not teaching her properly. Mm -hmm. um, and Jane Austen does such an, an amazing job of writing teenage girls and in particular writing annoying teenage girls. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, I think it's impossible to read Pride and Prejudice and not be annoyed with Lydia for what she's done, not just to herself, but to her family. But then when you do take a step back as a modern reader, you're like, wait, she's 16 and she's running after boys and, you know, not not wants to go to parties and, you know, doesn't want to like settle down and be serious. And like, that's, that shouldn't be a lifetime offense for a 16 year old. Right. <laughs> like, we don't marry 16 year olds off because they tried to get with an older guy. Um, and so it really sort of, it bothered me a little bit. And I think it's supposed to bother you. Like, you know, I think this is, there might be differing opinions on what Jane Austen thought of Lydia, but I do not think that she thought that Lydia should be doomed to a bad marriage at 16. Right. Um, Nobody should be doomed to a bad marriage at 16 or any well, age right. at that point. I mean, any age would be great, but like at 16, you definitely have a chance to grow out of it. Um, and so I, yeah, I just, her character kind of stuck in my mind and I really, I, during the day I was writing about terrible things happening to women all the time. And, you know, often, usually there wasn't any kind of like happy ending to the stories I was writing for Sam. And I just like, I, I thought about this character a lot and I was just like, God damn it. I want to give her a happy ending or the <laughs> chance at a happy ending. Um, and I sort of, start, sort of started thinking like, if I retell the story from her perspective, like what might we have missed? What might be a little different? And also like, what would it take for this character to actually find the possibility of some happiness? And I realized uh, it would have to be a fantasy novel because in in the world of Pride and Prejudice, uh, her fate is pretty dire and she's yeah. probably not going to have a very happy life. And there isn't really a way around that. So witches. Witches. That is the best way to do it. it always incorporate witchcraft because it's timeless and amazing. Mm -hmm. um, I loved it. Probably my favorite thing about the book. And um, those who are listening, the book is amazing. It is wonderful. If you want an audio version, there is a really great audio version, which I did download mm. because I like to sometimes do that, especially with a very hefty book like this it's not super hefty but it was hefty but it was such the audiobook was so good and so well read that oh, you literally wonderful. sound it sounded like it was Lydia's voice that, that's my friend Amy who reads the audiobook she um, did brilliantly <laughs> and I, yeah I feel like she, she's a terrific actress I think we were really lucky to get her um yeah. I asked her to submit because um I really among other things I knew she had a great comic voice and would kill it, um, but she's also English, um, yeah. and I I knew that she would really like nail the voice of Lydia, and she, she did. did. She nailed it so exquisitely and made the audiobook so enjoyable because you didn't feel like you were listening to an audiobook. You felt like you were in Lydia's world listening to her. It was oh, just awesome. brilliant. So uh, props to Amy for that. <laughs> but the book <laughs> I will was tell you said that. oh good. And my favorite thing that like you did with the book is Lydia's constant breaking of the fourth wall and bringing <laughs> the reader into the story. Like I'm writing this for you, but I'm also telling you this story, and you're going to be in this story. And it's like, are we? Are what? <laughs> <laughs> And it was just so humorous in those ways. And I also really liked your spin on Kitty because Kitty is also kind of one of those characters in Pride, of Pre Pride and Prejudice who's almost kind of like an offshoot character. Like she doesn't have, she has a story, but she doesn't have as big of a story as like, say, Jane or Lizzie. And she's almost kind of forgotten in a lot of ways. And you bringing her in in the way that you did basically gave her much more of a voice, which was really amazing. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I had the same feeling. She, you know, in Pride and Prejudice, she doesn't drive the plot at all. She's really kind of just there as a sidekick to Lydia. Mm -hmm. um, and I think also, you know, Jane Austen obviously wanted to have a lot of daughters to really heighten the plight of the Bennett girls. Um, so she's sort of, you know, by the time she got to number four, which is Kitty, like, Kitty doesn't have a whole lot to do. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I sort of, it, 
it, it it also seems like Kitty doesn't have much to do in the family, like within the world of the book. Mm-hmm. Nobody seems to pay all that much attention to her except for Lydia. And even Lydia isn't like, you know, Lydia is not a very thoughtful companion. Um, and she's sort of Lydia's sidekick, even though she's a little bit older. Um, and it really got me thinking about like, well, what would it like to be that person in the family? And when I started writing the book, I knew that um, Kitty would have to be a big part of it because she and Lydia are very close in the book. So obviously if Lydia was a witch, she would know. And so I started thinking like, is Kitty a witch too? She doesn't feel like she would have that kind of power. She feels more like a sidekick. Mm -hmm. Uh, And then I remembered her name was Kitty. And and lo and behold, she ends up becoming the familiar of the group, which is even Mm -hmm. better. Uh, So I loved that. And I loved how humorous that um, the fourth wall breaks where I also loved it, the interactions between Kitty and Lydia and how <laughs> I, there was one scene and i think it was when it, the oh i don't remember his name now um but he was showing them the the sleight of hand trick and mm-hmm. um she's like do you want me to claw his eyes out i will do it and i'm like <laughs> wow calm down giddy he's not a bad guy i promise <laughs> oh it was so fantastic uh so oh, thank you moving- yeah kitty is um not the not she's she loves her sister and she's ultimately a very loyal and loving person I think but uh in my book maybe not the brightest tool in the box yeah that fits I would say also in Pride and <laughs> she's probably not the brightest tool in the box either okay agreed yeah <laughs> so um what kind of made you decide to um out of all the fantastical characters you could have chosen what made you decide witchcraft um it's a great question I honestly I don't remember exactly where that came from except again well okay it's coming back to me um (laughs) so one of the things that captivated me about Lydia is so all Jane Austen books take place in this very small protected bubble this sort of affluent sector of society where like you know, people seem to have a ton of time to go to balls and go on long walks and picnics and fall in love. And like, they are, especially if you consider that it's the early 19th century, they are very privileged. Mm-hmm. Um, and pretty much all the characters spend all their time, fran- you know, polite and calm on the surface, but frantically trying not to fall out of that world. Right. Um, yes. Because it's not stable at all. And it's hard to uh, keep the sort of social status and the money that you need to maintain being a part of that society. Um, and Jane Austen's books are very much within that narrow realm, um, like far more than any other even contemporary writer that I ever read. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, th- I think that narrowness is on purpose. You can sometimes kind of see almost like there are scenes where you can almost see her like peering around the corner or like shutting a door in the reader's face and like Jane Austen knows what's behind that door and she knows the right reader probably knows but she's not going to tell us right of um, course yes um so anyway the Bennett girls live in this very narrow world it's difficult some of them succeed in it some of them don't but Lydia straight up falls out of it and her life is going to be way harder because of it mm-hmm. but she is also going to see more of the world than her sisters see um, because she has sort of stepped out and thrown out of this protected little society bubble, um, she's going to see probably bad things, but also interesting things that they're protected from. And I started thinking, like, I don't want this to just be a sad story about her, you know, life of poverty and grimness and a bad marriage. Like, I want some of the things, I want her to gain something by stepping out of that world, too. And so I started thinking, like, what if there was more out there even than we thought? You know, like, what if outside of this bubble there's magic? Right. Um, and, and uh, yeah, so that's sort of where that came from. I absolutely love that. And um, probably the other thing that I really liked is how Lydia interacts with, you know, obviously other key characters throughout the, the tradition traditional story of Pride and Prejudice, like Georgina and all that and their interactions surrounding the the witchcraft itself those were just really 
special moments within the story that I'm just like, that's not traditional Jane Austen. That is Mm -hmm. all you. And it was just brilliant and wonderful the way that they interacted with each other. And I love that. And I also really liked how, even though the witchcraft was obviously a very large part of the story, it was also subtle enough to not take away from the story or not overpower it. And it made it to where it was actually just like the perfect balance within the story. So you got all of this beautifulness that she is a witch and that she does these things but it's not like oh i'm gonna go conjure a fireball and light this guy's house on fire because he annoyed me as mm-hmm. a teenage girl probably would. <laughs> yeah <laughs> if she had the power to do that she definitely would <laughs> oh she absolutely would <laughs> or she would light her sisters on fire for annoying her one of the two <laughs> probably that too yeah but she I liked her subtleness and that there were limitations within it as well which created this whole sense of realism throughout the book and it made it to where she was like yes I am a witch but I can only do this and everything comes at a cost versus you know a lot of fantastical novels that are like yes I can do all these things and look I created this city and I'm Elsa <laughs> essentially <laughs> yeah so, um, please just me yeah, don't sue me you. for saying that <laughs> I wanted it to fit into the plot of Pride and Prejudice and also to kind of map onto that world. Mm-hmm. Everyone in Pride and Prejudice is obsessed with money. Um, yes, and they have absolutely. to be in money order to and survive. Class. Money and class, yeah. Um, and on the surface, their world is very pretty. It has that aesthetic that we all love, you know, empire waists and curls and balls. Um, but underneath, there's a real brutality that she's writing about. Um, and so I wanted a, a magic system that reflected that, that reflected that sort of like the need to constantly count up costs, even for like personal decisions and romantic decisions. And I wanted those costs to be, I wanted her to be able to, to do things that were pretty, but that would cost her dearly. Absolutely. And that made it so much more real than anything else. So when you were writing the book, did you do a lot of research into witchcraft to kind of um, do that? Or did it all just come out of the ether into your brain? (laughs) Um, I did some research on witchcraft. Um, I did a fair amount on Obeya, 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 which is, um, yeah, yeah, um, which is a, you know, Caribbean uh, uh, magic tradition that has West African root. Yes. Um, that was really, really interesting. And I ended up just using little hints of it. Like, I feel like I could have happily, like I read so much more about that than, than I put in, partially because I think there are still people practicing it. And yes. even more interestingly, it is illegal still in some countries. That um, is correct. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, really, really fascinating. Um, so I wanted to sort of like, I, I, with that, and to some extent with what I ended up using as sort of English magic, I wanted to gesture towards real traditions because I I, I really like rooting things in like real myths mm-hmm. and, you know, real folk traditions. Um, but at the same time, I wanted to steer away from anything that might be, might feel too close to anyone's real spiritual practice. Um, so I tried to have little grace notes rather than using whole chunks of of witchcraft lore and history, basically. Well, the listeners of the show, if, if you're new to the show, you're, this will be the first time you're hearing it. But if you're not and you're a long-time listener, you'll also know that I also have a secondary podcast, which is Pagan Switchy Corner, and it's all about witchcraft. And so I will say that the notes that you put within the book, especially the hedge witchery notes, were actually very accurate and very oh, well okay. done. So <laughs> as somebody who is a practicing witch, you did it correctly. <laughs> oh, amazing. I wanted it to feel sort of like, like I, I, I thought about like, a lot of the times it, you pick up a book and the magic system often seems to be, you know, Latin and Greek or, you know, ancient languages. And I thought, like, I wanted this to feel very English um, mm-hmm. for the most part, especially the first part, and really rooted in um, it, witchcraft that grew up in a, a small English village yes. and had probably been there for hundreds or thousands of years. And it was very well done the way that you did it. And especially with the hedge witchcraft roots, um, there's a brilliant author who writes a lot about hedge witchery. Um, Her name is Tudor Beth, and she writes all about English witchcraft, which is really interesting. And so knowing all of her work, because I have every one of her books because I love her, (laughs) but um, reading all of her work, all of the stuff that you had put into your works 
very much tied very deeply into that. So it fit perfectly within the world. So you could very much see, yes, this is a witchcraft system, but obviously you weren't, you know, stepping on anybody's toes per se, you know, you Mm -hmm. were doing it beautifully within it, you know, making it feel natural and wholesome, especially with the gathering of the herbs and the bundles and all that. Obviously, a lot of them don't do the sacrifices that are mentioned in your book because <laughs> we don't do that in the modern age. That's just no, <laughs> we don't do that. I, hear it. Um, I made that part up, and it's good to hear that that was not <laughs> that's not how you guys roll. No, we don't roll that way, <laughs> but it was really well done. And uh, especially with a lot of the herbs that you were mentioning, that you were just like, This herb does this, and you have this bundle, and you put all them together, and it's like yeah yeah you're wanting to do this and those all fit together like it was just superb and brought such a great realism to the book which i was just like swinging with excitement (laughs) oh great i have like one or two books that i got about like english plant folklore and you know the like historical uses of plants and herbs so i tried to like if i was going to put something like that in i tried to be i tried to make it so if someone like you read it it would at least be plausible Yes, which was so great and such a wonderful thing. And it was funny because um, I was just recently talking with my witchy group about your book and they were just like, so is the book out now? Can I go buy it? And I'm like, yeah, you can go buy it. Go read it. (laughs) If you like Pride and Prejudice and Witchcraft, absolutely go buy the book. Also, shameless plug moment, everyone, go buy Melinda's book. It's fantastic. If you haven't already figured that out by now, go buy it now. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you. So, um, obviously the, you know, the book has come to a completion. Do you have any other works that you're kind of thinking about for the future? Um, that yet, you know, you can tease the audience about. Yeah. So I am hard at work. Hopefully by the end of 2023, I'll be done with the first draft of this, but, um, I am working on a book that's sort of a companion slash sequel to the Lydia book. Oh, lovely. Um, and it is in a slight, it's still fantasy, I would say, but it's in a slightly different genre. It's not really witchy, um, with sort of sci-fi inflected. And it centers Ooh. on the very intense, very try-hard middle Bennett Chester, uh, Mary. Oh, that will be interesting. That will be very interesting because Mary's also one of those ones that like, yes, she has accomplishments. Yes, she does things, but she's also one of those characters that you either love her or hate her because yeah. she's not she's not well-rounded as a character yeah. and she doesn't get well, a lot of screen time essentially <laughs> yeah the way I always think of Pride and Prejudice I kind of think of the narrator as like basically Elizabeth basically yes. like maybe an older and wiser Elizabeth that has a little more information about what was going on at the time but like when the narrator of Pride and Prejudice talks about her sisters it really seems like we're seeing them through her eyes. Yes, so absolutely. I think everything the books, basically the way I write about it is everything in the book that, that the book says about them is 100% accurate. I'm never going to contradict Pride and Prejudice. Um, but the things that you see your annoying little sister do might not be all of her mm-hmm. and might not be all that she could be. Um, I think Lydia is annoying and troublesome in one way that teenage girls are annoying and troublesome mary is super annoying in another way Mm -hmm. and a way that actually i mean i think i was probably more like mary when i was a teenager i was probably kind of a know-it-all and a tryhard so i have (laughs) um i i definitely can still get annoyed with her but i think that she also i feel bad for her and i think a lot of people are like that as teenagers and they do grow out of it and all often they grow out of it you know a lot of my friends were like that and you know, in high school, they were super annoying, try hard nerds. And <laughs> now they're journalists and doctors and lawyers. And getting out of high school really helps with that a lot. Um, but Mary's never going to get, she's never going to get to like leave town and go to college and find herself. Right. Um, so she's in a much more dire position. And also she already basically has a job, which is to get married and uh, get married to someone rich enough to take care of her and potentially some of her family. Um, and growing up that, you know, that you have one job and that you're probably not going to be able to do it. And your sisters are going to have to do it for you. Would do a number on anybody. You know, and kind of thinking in that world, in terms of like our modern world, you know, like that would be a very difficult world to grow up in and be like, this is your one job. Be pretty, be accomplished, get married. 
get married mm-hmm. to somebody rich as well. And it's like, yeah. wow, like that had to be such a stressful time for all those characters. And especially because like women didn't really, they had a voice, but they didn't have enough of a voice. Yeah. And totally. so, you know, having characters like, for example, Lydia, who obviously has a big voice and wants to use mm-hmm. her voice, um, but she knows she's not allowed to. So, yeah. you know, she has to do all these things to kind of garner attention for herself. And then when she is able to use her voice, she gets a little loud, a little obnoxious, and then ends up breaking everything <laughs> in the process. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Yeah, she doesn't know that she's supposed to be quiet and she very nearly wrecks everything for everyone. Yes, absolutely. And she does it in such a way that it's so well done. And I loved because obviously, you know, um, we don't get a whole lot of interactions between her and Wickham um, in the traditional one. But in this one, you, you did such great interactions between them that made them go, okay he's terrible <laughs> but he might be redeemable maybe mm-hmm. maybe oh, great. <laughs> maybe like it's yeah, a, i tried to keep it ambiguous till the end but. yeah until the very end uh, which i'm not going to spoil for anybody um but he, the interactions between them were so great and it was one of those moments that i remember um i want to say it was like chapter like 13 or something like that i don't know but um when he's just like i want to call a truce between us <laughs> and then she's like what what do you mean a truce? Like, she doesn't know how to have, handle him trying to be nice. And it was so humorous to the, watch the whole interaction between them. I loved it. It was so great. Oh, thank you. I they're really it. fun to write <laughs> together because they're both, you know, neither of them has great communication skills. They have a lot of feelings and a lot of hormones and not a lot of ability to talk about things as, as, as adults. And so they're just kind of two wrecking balls smashing into each other. And I love it. Oh, it was so great. So, so great. So I'm looking forward to the Mary book. I think that's going to be fantastic. I am, I mean, obviously I love the Lydia book, so I'm going to be like ham for the next one. Uh, so the, my next question for you is obviously, um, I, I don't think the Samantha B show is still on, is it? I don't remember. No. Yeah. I was going to say, I don't think it's running. I haven't looked in like a year or so because I just kind of gave up on TV for a while because you know, politics. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> um, are you doing any other writing for shows that you want to talk about? Or just oh, book no, I don't have anything to plug right now. I'm oh, really like, I'm just head down in this Mary book right now. Oh, that's perfect, that's, though. That's my main thing for the foreseeable future. That's okay, though. We we love a good writer that does all those things. Um, obviously, I just want to give you time to promote all your stuff. So, and you have another book that's out as well, correct? um oh you mean my older one yes your older one uh um, star cross still star crossed is that correct yes still star cross came out gosh i want to say 10 years ago 2016 um, yes um i think that was that the tv show or the book i think the book came out in 2013 um i'm looking at the book right now uh at least the audiobook came out in 2016 um oh. well that's nice. a date uh, yeah it's okay so the publication date for the book um is 2013 the audiobook mm-hmm. came out in 2016 yeah yeah so um but yeah uh i would, I would definitely love it if people checked that one out as well um, and very, that, that's basically a retelling of romeo and juliet correct yeah it takes place sort of starting about a week after romeo and juliet and it follows some of the montagues of capulets who are still standing which is you know not a lot um, and and in particular, two characters, um, Benvolio Montague and Rosalind Capulet, who are Romeo's cousin and the first girl that Romeo thought he loved. Mm-hmm. Um, and they get sort of entangled together in trying to stop the the feud from restarting as it's sort of sort of starting to boil over again. Oh, that sounds so good. I I honestly didn't know about that until recently. And I was like, okay, I have to also read this book. But, you know, there's only so many hours in a day. (laughs) Mm -hmm. So you get the audio book, you set it on two times the speed and you're off to the races. (laughs) That is very true. That is very true. The audio book is also out. Um, The narrator is Fiona Hardingham. Um, I'm sure I probably butchered that last name, but um, that is the narrator as well. So if you're somebody who likes specific narrators, that's who does the audiobook. Um, but the book is available in Kindle, hardcover, paperback, and obviously audiobook. So definitely check out. And that is still star-crossed. 
uh, older book, but it's also apparently a TV show or soon to be a TV show. It was a TV show. Oh, it was yeah, a TV show. Was, okay, on yeah, Amazon. There was so one soon season. to be doesn't have a date. So. Oh. <laughs> Somebody hasn't updated that. In Somebody a while. should it's... update that. <laughs> in this case, soon is 2017. Okay, perfect. <laughs> So the TV show is also out available for probably watching. So check that out. Um, now, obviously, you're working on the other book. And now, where can people go to connect with you on social media and kind of follow your work and all that good stuff? Um, it's a hard question, honestly. That is um, fair. I, <laughs> I am on Twitter still, but I'm really moving away from it for, you know, I deleted my reasons. account. I couldn't. I couldn't handle it any longer. <laughs> I, you know, I've been on it for so long that I've left it up in case anyone like needs wants to message me. But like, I don't think I'll really be using it going forward. I don't know. Um, so yeah, let's say Instagram. <laughs> That's fair. <laughs> uh, yeah, let's do Instagram. Uh, and my handle is just at Melinda Tao. Perfect. Um, all of those links will be in the show description for everybody um, who is listening. So that way you have easy access to find the books. You have easy access to find Melinda's social media and definitely connect with her. Now, if you do get a copy of the book, make sure you go and review it because the reviews help the authors far more than you know. And if you are unable to purchase a copy of the book, please go to your local library, see if they have a copy. If they don't request a copy and they will find it for you or purchase one themselves, which also helps the author. So make sure you are checking out your local libraries and support them as well. Uh, but Melinda... the thing that I just, sorry. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. <laughs> I just like, I feel like I just learned this myself and I have to spread the gospel of it. I didn't realize until recently that I could <laughs> download a library, an app for my library and check out audiobooks from it. Mm -hmm. Yep, is that amazing. is also a thing. Uh, yeah. I don't use mine. I probably should, but I don't because I, I'm i an Audible listener and I have been for years. And then I often will forget that my Audible exists and then I'll end up with like eight credits. And I'm like, oh, mm -hmm. yeah, I should probably use those. <laughs> yeah, been there. <laughs> so, um, yes, make sure you are checking out your local libraries. Please, please, please always review your books um, because they do help the authors. Uh, if you don't like the book, you don't have to review it. And if you're wondering, okay. like, Hey, um, I have this really great review, but I guess I have to put it everywhere. Yeah, you can just copy and paste it. It's the same <laughs> review. It works just as well. Trust me. I That's what I do. I just copy and paste the same one and put it on all the platforms. And I like your style. <laughs> saves you a lot of time from having to rewrite all those reviews. Trust me, just copy and paste. It's so much faster. <laughs> but it still works to help the algorithms of the books get seen and all that good stuff so make sure you are doing that but melinda this has been so much fun i've ha enjoyed having you on the show you will have to come back when your next book comes out and we can talk all about it especially about mary and her adventures um mm -hmm. which will be fantastic um yeah thank you so much for having me this was such a pleasure well everyone take care of yourselves be kind to each other and stay safe and i probably won't see you before the holidays so happy holidays everyone happy holidays. Thank you.